Shalom. Today we're going to start a new series on the Hebrew alphabet. I know many of you have been looking at these letters for a long time, some of you not at all, and so we're just going to go letter by letter, two letters at a time. Each set of two letters will spell a word, so you'll learn a word, and then we'll look into the extra meanings of that word, we'll look into a little gematria, maybe the counterfeits of that word. So we're just going to start very simply, two letters at a time. It will be helpful for you to have this font chart. If you go to the link below in the description box, you'll be able to pull down the font chart, and I would suggest that you do print it off. The first letter we're going to look at is the Yud. Start on the right side and count up to 10. You'll find the Yud. It's the smallest letter of the alphabet. It has a number value of 10. It just hangs at the top of the line. It's not, it doesn't take up the full line. And the picture meaning for the Yud is the hand. The fourth letter of the alphabet is the Dalit. The Dalit has basically two strokes, the stroke that goes across the top and then the one that comes down. It's characteristic of the Dalit that it pushes back a little bit to the right. It is a full size letter. And the picture meaning is the door. These two letters express an important principle, the principle of jots and tittles, which is in a different video. And you can click the link below in the description box so you can learn about jots and tittles, which relate to Yud and Dalid. So the Yud makes uh, basically a Y sound as a consonant, Y, and the Dalid makes a D, a D sound. And so together they spell Yad. And the word Yad means hand. And you can look it up under the Strong's H3027. It is literally the hand, the human hand. You might be familiar with the idea in a synagogue, they use this pointer when they're reading from the Torah scroll. It's also called a Yad, and it looks like a hand. The reason they use a pointer is not because the text is too holy to touch or something like that but because the chemicals in your skin can degrade the ink. And so they don't want anybody touching it for that reason. So one of the basic ideas behind Yad, behind your hand, is the power that you have. Genesis 3:22. And Jehovah God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, he said, Adam, you're out of here. The idea is that he has the power to pick this fruit. In Genesis 4, 11, And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. Speaking of Cain, he had slain his brother by his hand. He did it in his own power. In Genesis 16:6, 6. But Abraham said unto Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. Talking about Hagar, Hagar. Abraham said, You have the power over her. You do whatever you want. And in Genesis 16:12, And he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Speaking of Ishmael, that he will force his power against everyone, and everyone will try and power back against him. In a bit of an idiomatic way, we see Leviticus 27, 8. But if he be poorer than thine estimation, then he shall present himself before the priest, and the priest shall value him according to his ability that vowed shall the priest value him. So the, if the man cannot pay what the priest values, then the priest will take into account his income and his ability. The word ability here is two words. You can see that the second one is yad. You see the yud dalad. The first one is tasig, and tasig means like to achieve. So it's what he can achieve with his hand. What is his ability? In Proverbs 18.21, death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So the word power there is actually in the Hebrew, yad. So your tongue has a hand, but don't spend too much time looking for it. It is a custom to raise one's hand when making an oath. 
Genesis 14, 22. And Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto Jehovah, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth. So there it is exactly spelled out to lift up the hand, but it means that he swore to him. He made an oath to him. In Numbers 14.30, we see the translation, Doubtless you shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, said Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. Literally, it says to lift up the hand. The word consecrate is also an idiom that uses the word hand. Exodus 28.41 And thou shalt put them upon Aaron thy brother and his sons with him, and shalt thou anoint them, and consecrate them, and sanctify them, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. Literally, the expression there is to fill the hand, and it's always translated as consecrate. Consecrate means to make holy. What are they putting in their hands? I'm guessing probably some portion of the offering that sets them apart to be in the priest's office. Another translation of this word yad is tenon. And so here we see a picture of the two boards going together, talking about the construction of the Mishkan tabernacle. Exodus 36, 22. One board had two tenons, equally distant from one another. Thus did he make for all the boards of the tabernacle. So you can see the little piece at the end of the board that will be sliding into the slot. That is the tenon. It looks like a hand. Another idiom which uses the word hand is presumptuously. Numbers 15.30 But the soul that doeth aught presumptuously, whether he be born in the land or a stranger, the same reproacheth Jehovah, and that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Literally, it means with a high hand, with a hand lifted up, kind of maybe like a show of power, or maybe like you're poking God in the eye. Yad is also translated as place in Deuteronomy 23.12. Thou shalt have a place without the camp, whither thou shalt go forth abroad. When you need to do your business and you carry a little shovel, there's a special place for that outside the camp, and that's called Yad. We see it again in Isaiah 56.5. Even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than of sons and of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. So if you know the word for name, Shem, then this phrase is Yad Vashem, a place and a name, Yad Vashem, and that is the name of the Holocaust memorial in Jerusalem, Yad Vashem. Yad is also used in an idiomatic expression for the word wide in Psalm 104, 25, and in a lot of other places. So is this great and wide sea, wherein are things creeping innumerable, both small and great beasts. So the idiom is urachav, which means wide or the width of yadayim. You see the yad there? It's, it's in a plural form. And so maybe the picture is if you put your thumbs together and then you spread your hand and you made your pinkies go as far as they can from each other, this is a kind of a maximum width, and that's how wide the sea is. Now, if you double the syllable and you have yad twice there, it's pronounced yadid, and it means lovely or beautiful. And this is so nice because it's something that's so close to you that it's hand to hand. The two hands are together. Psalm 84, 1. How lovely is your tabernacle, O Yehovah of hosts. In Psalm 127, 2. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. So there is one fellow who is named Yedida in Second Samuel twelve twenty five, and he sent word by the hand of Nathan the prophet, so he called his name Jedidiah because of Yehovah. It means uh, beloved of Yehovah, and this is the only time this word is used. It's a second name for Solomon. In a related root, if there's a hey, yud, dalad, hey, uh, this is always going to refer to thanks or praise. You probably know the word toda, which means thank you. It comes from this root. And what has your hand to do with praise? 
in 1 Timothy 2.8, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Here in Genesis 29.35, and she conceived again and bare a son, and she said, Now I will praise Jehovah. Therefore she called his name Judah and left bearing. So the, even the name Judah, Yehuda, comes from this concept of praise. Isaiah 51.3 For Jehovah shall comfort Zion, he will comfort all her waste places, and he will make her wilderness like Eden, and her desert like the garden of Jehovah. Joy and gladness shall be found therein, thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Now if we add the Yud, 10, and the Dalid, 4, together we get 14. So here's an interesting little thing about your hand. The little bones in your fingers are called phalanges, each one is a phalanx, and in fact you have 14 of them in each hand. It is written in the genealogy of Messiah that there are three sets of 14 generations from Adam to Yeshua. So here they are, and if you count from Abraham through David, you will find 14. And if you count Solomon through Jeconiah, you will find 14. However, from Shealtiel to Yeshua is only 13, so you kind of have to count Jeconiah twice, once at the end of the list and once at the beginning of the list. However, if you really look at this, if you track the genealogy, you'll see that there are a few people that are missing, uh, at least between Jehoram and Uzziah. Uh, there's an Ahaziah, of course, Ataliah. Maybe you don't want to count her. She was too wicked. There's a Joash and an Amaziah. They're not listed here. So it seems like somebody made a mistake, unless they were trying to deliberately make a statement that Yeshua is of the family of David. When we look at the name David, we have two Dalits, which you can recognize. In the middle is a Vav. And his name adds up to 14. So I think it's possible that the author was making a deliberate statement. Yeshua is of the line of David. Now if I asked you how many tribes there were, how many apostles, you would probably say 12 for each group. However, if you look at the list, it's a little more complex. So concerning the apostles, we know that Yeshua picked 12, but then Judas fell away. And they voted in a new guy, that was Matthias, except for you never hear of him again. But who comes along? Saul. So in the end, it seems like there were 14. They didn't know Paul was coming, but God knew that. When you look at the tribes, the initial list of brothers is 12. But then later, Jacob adopts Manasseh and Ephraim as his own. So when you look at all the lists that follow in Scripture, they are not consistent. There are always 12 in each list, but there are 12 drawn from this list of 14. And are we not his hands and feet in the earth? Now this is a counterfeit. Uh, if you've been to Israel at, all, Israel at all, in almost every gift shop, you will find these hands. They are called chamsa, which comes from the Semitic root chamesh, which means five. They are said to be the hand of the daughter of Fatima, Muhammad's daughter. But they are not only used by Arabs, they're used by Jews, and probably they were used by the Israelites even before the Arabs came along. They are uh, to ward off the evil eye. They're, they're a symbol of protection. As believers in Messiah, we do not look to talismans or amulets for our protection. We look directly to the living God. You can Google this, Hamsa, you can spell it H-A-M-S-A, and see the other designs. They almost always have that I in the middle of the palm. So for each lesson, we're going to have a memory verse, and this one is Psalm 31, 5. And I'll read it, and then I'll read it slowly, so you can track, if you're just learning to read, how to read, and we'll see what it means. Biyadcha afkid ruchi. Padita oti Yehova el emet. Biyad cha. So you see the yud and the dalit in the middle there. The ba means in, the yad is hand, the cha at the end is your. In your hand, af kid, I will entrust. Ruchi, you know the word ruach, 
spirit ruchi, my spirit. Into your hand I commit my spirit. Maybe that sounds familiar to you. Padita, you have redeemed, O-T, me. Yehovah, you know the name, El, God, Emet, of truth. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O God of truth. Biyadcha afkid ruchi, padita oti Yehova el emet. So that's it. You've learned two letters, yud and dalet. You've learned a word yad and many meanings for it. And some other interesting ramifications, some side notes. Until next time, tasimita inayim al hashamayim. Keep your eye on the sky. Your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.